All right, hello everybody. I'm really happy to be here and thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Anand. Thank you, Sissy. So, originally I called this the um, risks and opportunities of artificial intelligence, but uh, I realized that in 12 minutes I cannot do all of them. So it's some of them. Uh, a little bit of a disclaimer. This presentation contains no AI-generated content unless uh, otherwise noted. So this is because ChatGPT now is everywhere. So you have news anchors saying, hey, you know, this and this happened. Oh, by the way, ChatGPT said that. Um, and the other one is, why should you care about this? So I'll start with this. Fundamentally, I believe that geoprofessionals manage risk. And AI can help. Now, very brief uh, definitions so that we all are on the same page. Sometimes machine learning is considered to be a subset of AI. I, I, I prefer this definition from Professor Rashka, where uh, AI is actually not a uh, machine learning, so it is not a subset of AI, but they actually overlap. So when we think of AI, usually it's um, uh, robotic vehicles, autonomous vehicles. These are systems that take uh, inputs from the environment and they try to maximize the, their chances of success. Machine learning, this is mostly where we are at as a geoprofession and the way we experiment with machine learning. This is um, regression classification problems. And we do a lot of work there because it fits our workflows. And of course, in the middle, deep learning, and now we have generative AI and uh, ChatGPT, of course, uh, popularized this field. There's obviously a lot of interest in artificial intelligence and machine learning. Uh, this is a very quick uh, count of articles uh, in the earth sciences, so this doesn't only include the geoprofession, but it, it's here just to show you this rapid um, interest that it's growing so rapidly and uh, there's really a lot of interest in AI and machine learning in our field and there were some great presentations today there's uh, a lot of interest in that within this conference as well and I only see it growing actually so let me talk to you about some of my observations so far so what I've seen is there's mostly regression and classification studies in the form of proofs of concept so we do a lot of those, and that's good. It's very good that we do that. There are so many neural networks. So usually when someone gets started with AI, the first thing they do is uh, experiment with, with neural networks. I don't know why that is, maybe because it has a fancy name. Uh, and I'm noticing that we don't really have any significant or production-ready AI and machine learning applications, at least not yet. So this is an area where I'm really interested. This is where I'm focusing now. Some things that may be obvious, uh, I see that many academics know how to build good models, but they don't have access to good and a lot of data, and that's a problem. And then many, many public agencies or private companies, they have data, but they may not know how to build the models. So we need to do something to pair these organizations together. Data management is a whole different topic. I'm not gonna talk about this here, but it's something that we should seriously uh, consider improving. So how are we doing? Based on the articles that have, I have read and articles that I have reviewed, again, mostly these are regression and classification problems, or studies, I should say, and they are suspiciously, suspiciously perfect, many of them. So with regression, what we see is perfect accuracies above 90%, classification, same thing. And the first thing I do is I say, show me the data, because once we look at the data and we try to go beyond the data set that the researchers used, then we see something like this we put things into perspective. So there's a whole universe of possibilities, and what we have is we have pockets of brilliant researchers, nonetheless, who are just focusing on their small data sets, and they're building models around those data sets. 
the problem is then that these data sets, um, they, we cannot generalize, we cannot build models that allow us to use, let's say, AI to design deep foundations or other elements in different uh, and in varying conditions. ChatGPT, again, um, I'm going to mention that a few times. One of the reasons why it's so significant nowadays is because they push the boundaries. They, they, they train and they build a massive model, the newest one over a trillion parameters, many, many terabytes of data. So we can do that or can we do that? That's actually a question. So let's see. As far as the geo profession is concerned, oftentimes we wonder, is this a gimmick or is there real value? And what I see is our design methods are primarily empirical or semi-empirical, which means that they're actually primed for, uh, to be restudied or revamped with artificial intelligence. And the case in point here, this is a figure from uh, Norlum 1963, bedding capacity of piles in cohesion less soils. This is a method that we use a lot, and it was built on 42 uh, pile load tests, or it was derived from 42 pile load tests, I should say. So here's something to think about. Imagine what we would do if we were able to train models on 50, 100, 200,000 pile load tests. This, was, this is something that I'm absolutely uh, convinced about, that if we had, if we were able to use the data we would, uh, of all of these load tests, we would absolutely be able to build a model that generalizes and uh, dramatically improves the design of deep foundations in this case. So if you know me, you know that something that's really important to me is situational awareness. So in this presentation, I'm not going to go any uh, deeper into the specifics of AI or this talk, I should say. I want to just pause and, and, and think with you here, where are we? So this is a figure from Gartner. It's called the Gartner Hype Cycle. And what it does is it shows the different stages that maybe a technology breakthrough goes through uh, in its journey of maturity, let's say. So first it starts, innovation triggers, something new, a lot of interest, a lot of people uh, get into that. They, they, they learn more about it, they experiment, proof of concept and whatnot. And there's a point where they reach the peak of inflated expectations when they realize that, well, maybe things are not what we think they are. And then we go through the other steps eventually leading to, and hopefully, the plateau of productivity uh, eventually. I like to think of this also with respect to the levels of comp competence. I think they match really well. So, at the bottom, you have unconscious incompetence, something very new. We know what we don't know what we don't know. And then as we gain more experience, um, we, we go through these levels to eventually be unconscious, to, get, to, to essentially gain unconscious competence. This is where we stand with regards to the entire tech world. You can find this uh, figure. It's available online if you want to. Uh, a few things that you notice here, generative AI is near the peak, and deep learning is uh, at the trap of this uh, right now, where, where, where uh, things are being re rethought and revisioned with, with regards to what it can do. This is as of July 2022. ChatGPT was not out. I'm actually looking forward to see what's going to happen with it being out. So I'd like to ask you, where do you think we are? on our journey, meaning AI, machine learning in the geo profession. Are we just experimenting still? Have we reached the peak of inflated, ex inflated expectations? Are we going through the trap of disillusionment, slope of enlightenment, plateau productivity? I have my own opinion. I think we're near the peak, but I'd like you to think about that as well. So. Obviously, I couldn't go through this talk without bringing up ChatGPT. And you have your fair warning here. What follows is AI-generated content. I would like, again, to pause for a second. Even the fact that, at this moment, 
were about together here to see how well an AI model did answering this question is fascinating. Regardless of how well it does, it's still fascinating. So here's a prompt. I need to design the foundation system for a 12-story residential building in downtown Boston. What do you propose? So it starts with this, designing a foundation system for this building requires considering the soil conditions, building loads, local building codes. Here are some proposed steps for designing a suitable foundation system. So here's our intro. And we go through the steps. One, conduct a site investigation. Okay, so far so good. Determine the loads in the foundation. All right, I don't think I'm gonna, as a geotech, I don't think I'm the one calculating the dead and live load, but fair enough, I'll, I'll take that. Number three, select the foundation type. Based on soil conditions, choose a suitable foundation type. All right. Size of the foundation, again, so far so good. And now here, consider the seismic hazard. Boston is located in the moderate to high seismic hazard area. I said, hold on a minute, I'm not an expert in Boston, but I can look up a map, that's not what we have. So it went on to uh, come up with some other recommendations. So I said, okay, let me make it more specific. What, not just what you propose, what foundation system do you propose? So based on the information you provided, it says I, 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 I propose a combination of drill piles and a mat foundation. And it goes through the steps of defining what drill piles are, what mat foundations are. And the good point here is it tells us that we should consult a geotechnical engineer, thank God. <laughs> Now, the recommendation is not optimal. I talked to my colleague, Damien Siebert, who's a, a, an expert in this field, and he knows uh, that that's not optimal. But we can optimize this model, and this is uh, amazing. So there are ways that we can make this better with information from geotech tools, you name it. This is something we're working on. So I'm gonna leave you with this. I get this question a lot. Will AI replace me? And my answer is no, but a geoprofessional who knows how to use AI likely will replace you. So thank you.